this is probably, I think, the 15th year of our third Sunday of the month lectures. And I believe I've attended every one, so because of the role I play here at the homestead. And it's just nice to see this uh, continuing and for having Tom with us today. Some of you may have realized that Dan O'Neill, our director, has gone on to Homeland Security. And now we have our new director, Angie Grove, who we are very fortunate to have. And Angie, if you would like to come up and uh, introduce yourself and then introduce our speaker for today. Testing, testing, can you hear? Yes, okay. very good. Great. So, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, this is my very first monthly lecture series live, but I have been enjoying them via Zoom even before I became the director, but we're very excited to be back in person, and thanks for joining us for this. So I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker for today, Tom Anderson. Tom grew up in Essex, Vermont, and he first came to the homestead on the Winooski Intervale as an unsuspecting youth, back when this place was still a working family farm owned by the Morrill family. Tom was an insurance salesman and, in fact, the insurance sales provider for the Morrill family. And through that relationship, he was asked if he would like to move into a caretaker's home on the property, which was located on the other side of what is now Route 127. Tom lived here at the homestead for three years. Back then, the historic importance of this site and the little house sitting near the river was not well known to the general public. Then along came Ralph Mading Hill, a prominent Vermont historian and preservationist. And Tom worked closely with Ralph until Ralph's unexpected passing in 1987. After which, Tom worked effortless, effortlessly to see his friend's vision come to fruition. It is not an overstatement to say that without Tom's tireless labors, the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum would not be standing today. So today we are lucky enough to take a step back in time with Tom as he presents the founding fathers of the Homestead Museum, how Ethan Allen's home was rediscovered. Tom, welcome. Thank you. She did very well for her first introduction here. <laughs> she knows more about this than we do. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be here and address you. <laughs> if I uh, get choked up, it's because I'm the last survivor <laughs> of all of the people who worked on, on this project. Uh, they're all gone. And so if I say anything that's not true, nobody can refute me because... Uh, <laughs> Um, I uh, was asked to do this by Angie and I think John, and uh, so I've worked on this lecture for about two weeks on and off. And uh, it was difficult because I had to recall everything from memory. I'd had an insurance office in South Burlington on Ethan Allen Drive of all names, uh, from, uh, that's my phone, I forgot to shut it off. Um, no, it's in my pocket. Um, a farmer from Essex Junction. Um, so anyway, um, I had an office in South Burlington in the insurance business for 30 years and worked with lots of people and I sold my office last September and when I did obviously I had to move out and I had over 100 cases of files that I took home and set up a second office at my home even though I was retiring. I still had to go through all of the records to make sure all the tax records were eliminated from people's files and things like that. Um, I've been doing it for since last September and I'm still doing it. And I can't find all of the 
records and pictures that uh, would have helped us today. But at any rate, here we are. And so for two weeks, I have been writing my memories. Is this too loud for you? No. Um, and I compiled 20 handwritten pages. And then after reading it a couple of times, I said, you know, that's really not right. I started over again. So <laughs> I wound up with another 20 pages. So uh, I'll do my best not to confuse you, but to tell you the, the real story as I see it, uh, or it lived it. Um, OK. Um, to start with, um, this, according to Angie, this was supposed to be a, a, a record of the Founding Fathers and to talk about the Founding Fathers as opposed to the Homestead. You can read about the Homestead, but nobody knows the Founding Fathers like I do. Uh, they were all wonderful people. Um, Okay, you know a little about me. Uh, I'm not going to go into that anymore. But um, in order to talk to you about the founders, the, I'm kind of going to read and ad lib because there's a lot of detail that I don't want to forget. Um, the, the real, the original founder, as you know, was Ralph Nading Hill. And um, Ralph was a native Vermonter, born in Burlington on the hill. And I'm not sure uh, whether he went to UVM or to Dartmouth. My memory tells me that he went to Dartmouth, but I'm not sure of that. I did check it on, on Google, and it doesn't mention where he went to school. Um, Ralph um, was a, uh, became a, a famous author. Uh, one of my favorite books that he wrote is the Winooski, The Heart Way of Vermont. And again, um, that book was part of a series commissioned by the U.S. government called The Rivers of America. And uh, a, a famous author from each area of the country was commissioned to write a history of what they considered the most famous river in their area. So in Vermont, it was the Winooski. So um, I'm going to tell you later on about um, Nathan Ansell and the Ethan Allen Furniture Company. But because we're talking about the rivers, um, a fellow by the name of Stuart Holbrook, who was a native Vermonter, eventually moved out west to Oregon, I believe. And he was selected by the US government to write a history of one of the famous rivers in the west. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Ralph. Uh, Ralph was. Uh, the editor of Vermont Life magazine when it was a treasure and successful for a number of years. He was a trustee of the Shelburne Museum where he was a close friend of Electra Havemeyer Webbs and her husband Jay Watson Webb. And uh, oh good, uh, here's the book that Stuart Holbrook wrote uh, about Ethan. And uh, since he handed me the book, I'll tell you the other part of the story. I won't have to tell you later. Um, when the flood of 27 hit, uh, it wiped out the Ethan Allen factory in Beechers Falls, Vermont. Uh, if you've never been to Beechers Falls, it's hard to tell you how to get there because there's almost no roads that go there. It's way up in the northeast corner of Vermont, 
and you have to drive from here, probably take you four hours to drive up there. Very remote. Um, so as long as I'm on that subject, I'll tell you. Um, Nathan Ansel was born and raised in New York City. He, he grew up, his brother-in-law owned a furniture store in New York. And at one point, right after uh, Nate, as he was called, uh, graduated from college, he didn't have a job, he was an attorney, but no clients. So the brother-in-law asked him if he would tend the store while he went on vacation. So he agreed, he did, and because there was Again, no law business or anything else to do. He stayed on at the store. And uh, he uh, stayed there a long time. And while he was running the store, one day um, an agent from the so-called Resolution Trust, which was the agency that picked up after the Depression and went around and, and liquidated assets that the government had loaned money on. So he walked into Nate's furniture store and said, I'd like to sell you a furniture factory. And uh, so Nate said, he, I laughed at him and told him, well, you can't sell me anything because I don't have any money. And uh, the agent laughed and he said, well, you don't need any money. He said, well, well what do I need? He said, I just need you to go to Beecher's Falls, Vermont and take over a furniture factory. And the price is $25,000 and you can pay me whenever you can, as much as you want. So he took a trip to Beecher's Falls and discovered the, the factory there that made hardwood furniture. and. Uh, a few years went by, they did very well. The, the factory was improved and so on, and then the flood of 1927 hit, and it came down through the valley, Beecher's Falls, and it, it didn't wipe out the factory, but it flooded all of the machinery. And it took all of their hardwood lumber that was stacked outside, took it all down the river. And it floated into the trees and, and further down, down the river. So um, he, he wasn't there, of course, when that happened, but shortly thereafter, he drove his Model T from New York City to Beecher Falls. And he, uh, he met with the employees and he told them that the company was broke and they no longer had jobs. So they recounted and said, um, well, we'll stay and we can rebuild the factory. We'll clean it up and we'll oil all the equipment and we'll go out and find as much lumber as we could and bring it back and so on. And so, so they did. And, uh, and as a result of their doing that, the, the company stayed in business. And uh, I knew about this firsthand because years later, in the 80s, um, I had become uh, Nate, Nate Ansel, Nathan Ansel, became very famous. He was the, the sort of the original founder of the Ethan Allen, uh, the furniture company in New York. It wasn't called Ethan Allen then. But he said that in the early days when he went there, he said there was no store where you could go in and a woman could walk around and furnish a house. If you wanted to buy a table, you had to go to a table store. If you wanted to get ch chairs, you had to go to a chair store. So he recognized that this was not a good thing for people to do and he put together the concept of having all the furniture in a house that a household would need to to uh, set up business. So that's what happened. And as they progressed, 
the company became successful, but it still wasn't called the Ethan Allen Furniture Company. But he had made a number of trips to Beecher's Falls and checked on uh, the employees and what they were making and so on. Well, on one of his trips, just in 1936, uh, he was going to be going to the World's Fair and taking some furniture there. So when he went to Beecher's Falls, he stayed at the Colebrook Hotel in Colebrook, New Hampshire, just on the Connecticut River. And he liked to play poker. So uh, on this last trip, just before he was going to take some furniture to the World's Fair in Chicago, um, he was playing poker. And Stuart Holbrook and others chided him about the name of the company because he had named the company the Israel Putnam Furniture Company. And Holbrook chastised him and said, who the hell ever heard of Israel Putnam? He said, if you want a successful name, it ought to be Ethan Allen because everybody in Vermont and the surrounding states knows Ethan Allen. So the next day after the poker game, he went back to the factory and they had an in-house blacksmith who made up a, a square plug and they got all the furniture together that had been stamped Israel Putnam and they burned out the name of Israel Putnam and replaced it with the Ethan Allen Furniture Company. So that's how it got its name. And. Um, so um, then Holbrook, uh, following that, continued to write his book on the history of Ethan Allen. And um, if you read various book reviews about the books that have been written on Allen, it says that this is one of the better books. Um, I don't know all of them, but they're have been a number. And uh, so that's how it got its name. And, uh, and as the, the years went by and uh, Ralph Nading Hill was starting to uh, get involved with finding Ralph's house, uh, he heard that Nathan Ansel uh, was might be interested in helping out. So he called Nathan, who came to Burlington and, and met with him. And uh, Nat actually gave Ralph the first $125,000 towards the starting of, of this project. So uh, I'm off schedule, so let me uh, go back a little bit. Um, I was telling you about about Ralph, and he was a, a great fisherman, and and he liked to fish, and and he used to come with his boat. He lived on uh, on the banks of Burlington, and not many people know this, but the house that he lived in was sort of up above the Red Rocks cliff, and. Uh, it was an old house, kind of half log and half traditional, built in the 1800s. And it is the house that uh, Electra Webb and her husband, Watson, spent their honeymoon in, in Ralph's house. And they looked across the bay and saw all the land on the point, and that's when they decided they would like to own that land and make a farm out of the whole thing. So. Uh, I've never seen that written anywhere, but Ralph told me that, that uh, that's how they started. And um, you, you can read various accounts of that land because obviously it was the most beautiful piece of land along the lakefront there. And because it goes back into the 1700s, uh, it's the first piece of property that was settled by the settlers. I don't know just how many small farms there were that comprised the several thousand acres that they ended up owning, but uh, uh, the web started buying uh, 
those farms up and took a, quite a long time, but they succeeded in, in buying all those small farms and converting them into what we now know as the Shelburne Farms, which I think consisted of, I think it was about 5,000 acres, because it went from the, just south of Shelburne Point, uh, and it went all the way down uh, through Shalott and took in several miles of, of lakefront. So anyway, um, Ralph was, was friendly with Mrs. Webb because he was advising her on, on the items that she ought to include in her, her museum to be. And Ralph loved boats, and he was familiar with the Ticonderoga boat, and he ended up buying the Ticonderoga. And Ralph uh, operated it for two years, and he told me that he discovered that he couldn't afford to operate it anymore because he couldn't find people to shovel the coal. And uh, so he uh, talked Mrs. Webb into buying the, the Ticonderoga and moving it up onto the site that would become the Shelburne Museum. And uh, as a youngster I was around, I, I saw that process. They brought the boat down, they dug a huge moat, and they moved the boat into a, a, a moat, and then they put dirt behind it, made a complete surrounding moat, and then they flooded it and started hauling it forward towards the museum, and then they laid tracks from where the boat was all the way across what would now be Bay Road up into the museum. And they would take uh, the rails out after they pull the boat forward, and they'd put the rails ahead, and they'd leapfrog <laughs> until they got the boat all the way up into the museum. So, um, about that time, uh, Ralph had a, a lifelong desire to find Ethan Allen's house. And, and of course, he was a student of the lands and, and this area, and everybody knew where Ethan's lands were, but uh, people wouldn't wouldn't agree with him in terms of specifically where it was because the town clerk's office in Burlington had burned to the ground twice, destroying all the records. So they didn't have any specific records of, of where the house might have been. Uh, they knew pretty much all the land that he owned, but uh, didn't know specifically about the house. Um, and so uh, Ralph took his boat from South Burlington and he told me he used to come down to the mouth of the river and he would come up the Winooski River here and he would look uh, to see a site and a house that possibly could have been Ethan's house. Well, from my memory going back to the 80s, when I first came here, there wasn't a tree to be seen. Uh, it was all meadow land, and it was flat, and the only structure here was Ethan's house and, and this barn. And uh, this barn was built by Al Morrow, who uh, married Burl, and they owned the Pease Green Company together. And they built that barn to store hay and crops that they raised here. And uh, so the, the only house was, was the, the Allen house. But you couldn't tell that it was a primitive house. It had been added on to several times. There was an addition here and one there and one over here. And the roof line had changed and, and so on. Definitive. And Burl Morrow was a student of history, but she didn't.
kept looking and looking and he told me I would come here and I would sit out there and I'd look at this house and say, it has to be Ethan's house. So somewhere along those years, he got involved with uh, what would become the Winooski Valley Park District, which were, I think, what, five towns that fronted on the river that were trying to put together an association to uh, have some input into how their towns were going to develop along the river. So, um, so he did that, and uh, he was he was pretty much able to determine without even knowing it that this for sure had to be Alan's house. So I think he helped raise the money to buy um, this land, that 200 acres of land that they wound up with here. <coughs> and, um, and once they, they acquired the property <coughs> in the name of the Winooski Valley Park District, he got serious about uh, tearing the house apart to see if, in fact, it was Ethan's house. So he went to his old friend, Bob Francis, who worked at the Shelburne Museum. Bob um, personally surveyed and was responsible for taking apart every house on the Shelburne Museum and moving it from either out of state or some other town, there were some buildings that came from southern Vermont, some from New Hampshire. He took two major buildings from Shelburne, and uh, <clears throat> they were brick buildings, and he took them apart, brought them back to the museum, resurrected them. That's no easy task. And uh, <clears throat> so Ralph, uh, not Ralph, but Bob had retired by the time Ralph said, I've got to prove that this is Ethan's house. So he went to Bob and said, you know, will you come out of retirement and come down and now that we own this house, you can start taking it apart to see if the original dimensions match what Ethan ordered. So he did. I don't know how long that took, but uh, they ended up with a house that was, what, 20-something by... Uh, 22 by 32. 22 by 32. Yeah. So, once he proved that, he got very excited about resurrecting the... <coughs> renovating the Allen house. So, he... <coughs> I don't know where he got the money, but he told me that it took about $200,000 to... Uh, pull the house apart, renovate it, and put it back together. So uh, that's how they found, found the house and decided to go forward. Um, I, um, I can't relate to you the, the exact time frame. It may, it's my understanding, Angie told me that uh, they were doing some research, right, Angie, to find out um, when all the exact negotiations were complete. When I got involved here in the 1980s, um, everything was done with a handshake and talking. There were not many uh, written records. And um, from day one, there was a lot of arguing and disputing between Ralph and, and the, the Winooski Valley Park District. And, and as they matured, and the way I got involved here um, at, at the home site was, as Angie said, um, I, my first job was with the Connecticut General Life Insurance Company an old company like John Hancock and Met and so on. And uh, they had a, an old office in Burlington. 
and a number of agents through the years. And I was hired as a what they call a management trainee. And the number that they gave me was to call on 750 orphan policyholders, people who had bought policies and their agents had died, moved away, retired, or whatever. And I was supposed to call them, make an appointment, go out and talk with them. Say, you know, is your beneficiary current? Do you need any more? Do you have any questions? This and that. So I did that for a year, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, one of the people that I called on was Burl Morrill, who was the owner of the Peace Grain Company. She was a direct descendant of Daniel Webster's. She went to a business college somewhere in New England, and when she finished, she came to Burlington, got a job with the Peace Grain Company, and after a number of years, Mrs. Pease died and sold, sold her the company. I don't know anything about Mrs. Pease, and she was an old maid, as I understand it, and uh, the company was a successful operating company, but it wasn't huge. So, Burl ran the company. One day, uh, Salesman came in looking for a job and she hired him and his name was Al Morrow and I don't know how long he stayed there before they got married but they did and uh, he was a pretty aggressive guy and he's the one who built this barn and, uh, and he was first rate guy and so uh, she was one of the people that I had to call on and being very interested, and she liked to talk. I uh, I used to come two days a week uh, at 10.30 in the morning to talk with her about insurance and, and history of Burlington, which she liked. But we had to be done by quarter of 12 so that she could drive down North Avenue go to her house, have lunch, and watch the soap operas every day. So, so I did that for a long time. And uh, one day I went there, and she said, uh, she asked me where I lived, and, and I said, I live on King Street. And she said, well, how much rent do you pay? And I said, $36 a month, including heat and hot water. So she said, well, do you think you could afford $50 a month? And I said, yeah, I could probably manage that. Why? She said, well, I have a tenant's house and I'd like you to move in. So that's how I got here. I moved into the tenant's house. And uh, it was lots of fun. And uh, they also raised eggs here. They had thousands of chickens. And uh, so they had long hen houses around the property that they had people that tended to and they sold eggs. So. Um, so that was uh, very interesting. And uh, so um, along about that time, I, I um, had gone from being a, a management trainee to a full-time agent. They wanted me to be a manager, but I didn't want to leave Vermont, so I said, I'll become an agent work on commissions. So I did that and uh, the years went by and I then was approached by a couple of young guys who uh, were in the process trying to buy the Chase Mill. And there was a business in there called Riverside Wholesale Paper Company. And I don't know where the paper came from, but uh, they, uh, they provided and serviced just about every general store in Vermont and New Hampshire. And they sold everything you can imagine that a general store would sell. Fishing tackle, guns, no food, but bags, clothes, every possible thing you can imagine. So these two young guys wanted to buy the business and they went to Dudley Davis and Dudley said he would finance 
the business but not the building. So why don't you go and find somebody else to buy the building and lease it back to you. So I didn't know either of these people, but they came to me and said, would I consider buying the building? So I went and looked at it, and it was, it was a wreck. Uh, it had closed in 1953 when the Korean War ended. From about 1900 to the 50s, it produced only woolen clothing for the military. And um, so these two old gentlemen, the, the Cohen brothers, uh, bought the, the property and they started this wholesale supply company. And uh, they did very well. And, and then they wanted to retire, so I don't know how they found these two young guys, but um, they, they came to me and said, would you consider buying the building and leasing it back to us? So again, I went and I looked at it, and uh, of course I was young and inexperienced and didn't know that if you could look through the roof, it wasn't very stable. And, uh, and uh, it had a 100 amp service, had one toilet with a, with a pull string on the light bulb, in, in the toilet. And uh, so, anyway, I went to Clark Gravel's office, good old attorney in town, and told him that I could buy this and I probably could afford it and uh, would they do a lease for me. So they did a lease for me, which cost, in those days, that was 1977, cost $6,000. So. I thought that was a lot. They said I was protected. So uh, the business operated for about 18 months. I got my check every month and they put money into escrow for the repair of the building and so on. And uh, at the end of the 18th month, the rent stopped coming. So I went over there. They had one employee. The employee said that they left on Friday and said they were never coming back. <laughs> and, and so here I am, you know, standing there wondering, what do I do now? So, so I, I went there every day for two or three weeks and I just sort of stood guard because I thought that the creditors would start knocking on the door and want money or merchandise. Well, after several weeks, only one creditor sent me a letter and said that they wanted $125,000 worth of merchandise. So I said, that's no problem. Come on over, bring your, your big truck and I'll help you load it. So we went out and we, one day, it took us about a day to go through. They had a list of things that they wanted. And so we filled up a tractor trailer truck. They left. I never heard from them again. And I, and I never heard from any other creditor. So um, after a month or so, I decided, boy, I'm in trouble. Uh, I have this huge building, about 300,000 square feet. And you can't imagine it was filled the ceilings were 15 feet high. It was filled from floor to ceiling with merchandise of every kind you can imagine. Clothing, fishing tackle, guns. So, anyway, I put a, I put a sign out front, uh, space for rent, we'll build a suit. Well, that was 1977, 79. Imagine this, in all of Greater Burlington, Chipman County, there wasn't one tin building. There were no tin buildings as we know today that businesses have, nothing. If you wanted a space to start a business, you were in trouble. There wasn't much available. So I thought, well, I'll just, uh, the whole building was divided into columns 12 feet by 24 feet deep. And so people would come, we'd walk down the aisles, we'd count off the 
the divisions and I, we'd look back at the space and I'd say to them, well, how much space do you need? Well, I don't know. Well, look at the space. Is that enough to do what you need to do? So they'd say yes. Nobody brought an attorney. Nobody brought an architect. It just didn't happen that way. So I, I walked everybody off. I hired carpenters, plumbers, and in two years when I got through, I had 52 tenants in the building. And every major company in Burlington started there. Biotech, Jogbra, American Mailings, Resolution, they all came. And I built their space for them. And it was beautiful space. They loved it, had oil wood floors, and uh, the, the floors were pine planks about 10 inches wide with a spline in them. And they oiled the floors when the mill was running every Friday night, so the whole place was reeked of oil. And uh, so anyway, um, that's uh, how I rented the, the mill out. And, uh, and it, was, it was the best 10 years of my life. I had it for 10 years and I met wonderful people. And uh, one day while I was there, uh, and at this point, I hadn't met Ralph Hill or George Little or any of the people I worked with, but um, George Little and, and Ralph Hill were going by and they saw the changes taking place at the mill, so they stopped in and they said, you know, what's going on here? So I talked with them and, uh, and they thought it was great that I was renovating the mill and they had also heard that I knew the Melansons who happened to own the old mill tavern in Minuski, which was famous, uh, Dimey Beers, and when you went in, you had to put a 50 cent deposit on your glass, because everybody, was, all the students were stealing the glasses. And uh, so, um, so um, we began talking, and we talked about the history of the mill, we talked about the the Allen Farm, and that's how I, I got to know Ralph. And uh, so we struck up a, a great friendship, and from that point on, we were together a lot. Well, in the process of doing the mill, the flood of 27 had come roaring down and had filled the whole basement. The, the mill was built on a great big ledge that slid down towards uh, where the bridge is now and and it had filled it all with silt and there was no no entry to it and there was really no reason to be in there except to work on on equipment so um, I crawled in one day there was about two feet of crawl space between the top of the sill and the floor. So I crawled all the way in and, uh, and I crawled around and, and I, uh, I found, I've got to show you something. Yeah. Um, looking for my... So in the process of
they had um, leather belts on them. One leather belt went out through the slot in the side of the building and was hitched to a huge iron wheel that was turned by the river coming down and turning an undershot wheel versus an overshot wheel which turned like that. So there was a belt from one side to inside. Then we had the wheel next to it, and there were three floors above in the mill, and again, a belt about 30 inches wide went up through holes in the floor, all the way up to the third floor. And then on every floor, there was, there was a great big amount of lever, and there was a, another wheel here, and we're going to pull that lever down, it pushed that wheel into the belt. And, and because those wheels were running all the time, uh, pushing that belt in on the, on the, let's say, on each floor, it then was connected on that floor to spindles that went the whole length of the belt. The building was 300 feet long, and you had spindles running the whole length of, of every floor, not only one, but one here, one here, one here, where employees stood. You know, and then they, they operated in the for thousands of them. And they were all powered by the leather wheel off those. Um, they, they were all powered uh, from from the, those those wheels. So I'm in there crawling around. I see those wheels, and I say, "Boy, I'd like to have an office down here." So so there was no entry there. So I got hold of a big excavator brought them in against the, the, what would have been the east end of the building, and I had them dig a hole, a big hole, about half the size of this porch. And he went down 10 feet, and there we hit all this beautiful redstone, which is very hard. It's on the order of granite. And the white white went around and I measured the width at the bottom for years I did that. The foundation was 33 inches wide at the bottom and tapered up two feet at the top. And then on top of these walls they put a one inch thick cast iron plate and then all the beams from the building were on these uh, did they get to see those pictures in the back? Did you see those? And, and so, um, so all of the wood in the mill was resting on cast iron plates. Nothing touched stone or brick because that attracted moisture and would rot, rot the beams out. So anyway, I dug the hole. I hired the main drilling and blasting company to come over drill through the, the stone walls and blast me out a hole. So they, they blasted out a hole about uh, 8 by 10 feet. And then I brought in a small Kubota excavator and I got all the five guys with wheelbarrows. And the guy with the excavator loaded the wheelbarrows and the guys took it out the north side of the building and dumped all the fill because it had all been washed away by the flood. So when you went outside the wall, the land dropped off like this. So I filled it all back in, made a nice lawn, had flower gardens and so on. By the time I got through, I had 2,500 square feet of nice space that I could develop into an office. So I did. And when you look at those wheels, um, that's after my office was finished, and my desk was right in front of it, and my office was 900 square feet, which is a big room. And uh, so, after I, I met Ralph, and he started coming down there, 
they all wanted to hang out in my office. So about once every two weeks, I'd have Ralph, George Little, Hilton Wick, all kinds of people would come there and we would sit there and we would talk about how are we going to resurrect the Allen Homestead. And uh, so that's where it all started, was in the, the basement of, of that mill in terms of how do we do it. So um, we, we talked and we talked and we'd meet periodically out here and we'd look at the house and, and uh, we just had an understanding that um, the, the house had to be uh, presented to the public. So Ralph told us one day, he said, I know an architect in New York that might give us some advice. His name is Richard Robinowitz, and he was the architect of South Street Seaport, Miracle, Philadelphia, and so on. A really knowledgeable guy. So we invited him up. He looked at this empty building, he looked at the Allen House, and he went back to New York, and, and then he called me one day and said, why don't you come to New York and look at some of the things that I've done, I can show you pictures. So five of us, uh, Lola Aiken, Lincoln Brownell, Hilton Wick, and uh, I forgot any others, but we drove to New York, we stayed over two nights, and, and we talked at length with Robinowitz, and he said, I'll be back in touch. So we drove back to Burlington, and he, he then sent us some drawings and said, you know, you have, you finished the house, you've done a nice job, but now you have to present it to the public, and you need a place to do that. And he said, you've got this nice barn, you ought to finish that barn off so you can have meetings in there, people can be in out of the weather and this and that. So we talked about it, and and, uh, and that was bef before Ralph died. Uh, Ralph died in December of 87, I think, and uh, right up until that point, we had finished the house, but we didn't know what else we were going to do, except that we, we needed to do something and probably finish his barn. So, um, Ralph had told me that he had bone cancer and that it was slow growing and he'd probably be around to, to give us advice and so on, but if he wasn't, would I promise him that I'd finish, finish the job? So, that's how I really got tucked in. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll finish it. So. You know, Ralph, instead of having bone cancer and dying, he had a cerebral hemorrhage one night and died in his sleep. So all of a sudden, here we are. We have spent a lot of talk and we have an idea and we're saying, okay, we have to finish this. So the people that, uh, that I got together was George Little, Lincoln Brownell, Nathan Ansel, Lola Aiken, Sylvia Kaiser, John Ewing, and Hilton Wick, and myself. And we said, what are we going to do? Uh, by that time, I had gotten some estimates in, and the estimates were all coming in at eight or nine hundred thousand dollars to do what we wanted to do here. So, we we had several meetings, and we talked, and I had narrowed it down to doing business with the Farrington Construction Company because they were local, they were honest, they had some good thoughts and so on. So we decided to go with them, and the price was $850,000. So where were we going to get $850,000? So it was decided that um, I knew Hilton. I should go to Hilton and talk with them about um, 
alone to do this construction. So I did, and wasn't much to it. He said, yeah, if you all sign personally, no problem. So, <laughs> so, so we did. And uh, we, we borrowed the $850,000, and then the crew elected me to, uh, to go negotiate further with the bank, sign the paperwork, and to then negotiate the contract with Farrington Construction, which I did. So we started in, and it was a several month process, if not a year, to go through and do everything that we did. And, and we had, you know, like any construction, you had one issue after another that you didn't count on that popped up. So that's how we, we raised the money uh, to, to turn this building into the, what we call the orientation center, and it was decided to be the uh, Brownell Hilton uh, orientation center because uh, Lincoln Brownell uh, guaranteed the most money. I, my recollection was that he gave us about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to to get started, and and, uh, and Lincoln had been a childhood friend of Ralph's. They both grew up on South Willard Street in Burlington. They went to schools together, and then they separated when they went to college. And and Lincoln went in. Lincoln went into, um, God, I shut that off, I it's still ringing. Um, Lincoln uh, went into the service, became a pilot, and was very famous, I think, for flying the most number of trips over the hump and not being shot down. And uh, so, he was a very interesting guy, and, and through the years, he, um, in the war, he met a French Vietnamese uh, officer whose family was um, well respected in Vietnam, and this um, individual said to Lincoln, why don't you come back to Vietnam when uh, this war is over, and we'll start a business together. So they did, and uh, they wound up with probably the biggest American business in Vietnam. They had the import licenses for all the automobiles, appliances, and all kinds of things. They made a fortune. And, uh, and so Lincoln and his family stayed there in Vietnam for many years. They'd come back here a few times a year, and his kids all went to prep schools around the country. And uh, so he was there when the Vietnam War was in process. He also uh, owned a large uh, tourist agency in, in Saigon. And probably because the Viet Cong trusted him, because he had been there, uh, he became the spokesman for the U.S. military dealing with the, with the Viet Cong. And every morning at 6 o'clock he told me that he would talk to them and they'd tell him how to get more people out, get them on the planes, never mind the visas, just pack your planes, get them out. And, and every day they would check with him to see how many people got out. Well, came down to the final two days, and they told him, tomorrow morning at six o'clock, you and your wife and another officer and his wife who were there, who had been processing paperwork beyond the six o'clock plane, it's the last plane out of here. So he left, and that was it. He left everything behind, his business and everything, and his partner stayed. They, they arrested him, put him in jail. <clears throat> I don't know whether he was ever executed or not, but he didn't have an easy time of it. So that's how Lincoln uh, made his money and was generous with it to us.
and uh, I have uh, Lincoln used to come into my office and he would sit there by the hour and narrate the history of what happened and I've got about 10 hours of, of tape recordings that he recorded in my office about his experiences in Vietnam and, and uh, I have never shared those with anybody. I still have them and I, one of the things I hope to do if I live long enough is to resurrect them, get them out and see what we might do with them. So, um, okay, so any questions about what I've said to you? That'll be some questions. <laughs> Did the morals ever live in the house here? No. Yeah, one of their employees lived in the house. He was a. They they always had a lot of employees, and they had maybe two two families lived in, in this house because it was quite large by the time they added on to it. Other questions? Any questions about any of the other uh, founders? We had the founders were were Hill, George Little, Lincoln Brownell, Nathan Ansel, Lola Aiken, Sylvia Kaiser, John Ewing, Hilton Wick, and myself. Uh, those were the key people who signed on the dotted line. There were several others. There was Nick Muller, a historian. Bob Brownell, Sam Hamm, Meg Ostrom, Lois McClure. We had hundreds of other people that donated money after we got going, but um, up until then, we were the, the key people. Is the house over this way here, through this walkway here? What about it, Jeremy? Is the Ethan Allen house oh, through this walkway over here? Yeah, that's Ethan that's Allen's house, right? Right, right here. Right. And if you haven't been in, you should go in and, Got and look at it. I know it's difficult to date buildings. What, what is the uh, best date that is put on to the original structure? When was it uh, um, Somebody else might be able to give you the exact date, but um, when I was involved, um, Ethan ordered the lumber cut in 1783, the house was constructed, I think, in 1785, and he moved in in 1787 and died in 1789. Is that about right? Did he? Yes, he did. No, um, you could probably find some references to it, but it was my understanding that it went all the way to the lake all along North Avenue and right up into Burlington. I mean, this was considered Burlington, uh, even though the other side of the river was Colchester. And uh, after he died, um, a lot of family members stepped in and helped to raise money for and initially, the lands on the other side of the river, I believe, were leased out for farmlands, and then eventually they were sold off. Pardon? Were they originally Ethan Allen? Yeah, yeah, they were. So you had both sides of the industry. Right. Right. I was here yesterday, volunteer, and we have 14 files of of notes and papers, so as Andrew wants, you need to do something about moving those and digitizing them and so forth. So I took a couple folders home last night, and one of those that I was looking at was a letter written by Ralph Nading Hill, uh, dated uh, August 6, 1985, to the uh, Secretary of, a of the Agency of Transportation of Montpelier. I'll just read this one paragraph. John, could you speak yeah. into the microphone, please? Okay, yeah. Thank you. So the letter says, uh, Dear Secretary Crampton, in view of the fact that the northern connector, the Beltline, right, around North Avenue in Burlington crosses through the heart of Ethan Allen's farm and passes 
his restored homestead, which will become a national historic site and park, I would like to propose that the road from where it leaves the Intervale, uh, in the Intervale Avenue until it reaches the new bridge over the winter ski be called the Ethan Allen Memorial Drive and that it be appropriately marked at either end. So it's interesting that that was a proposal. I don't believe it's ever been acted upon, but it might be something that uh, we should look into. Susan was a personal friend of mine, and her husband was an attorney who drafted my, my lease for the Chase Mill. So <laughs> everything was very close knit here. Uh, but that, I had never heard that. That's, that's interesting. Um, one other item of interest, which I'll reproduce and pass around at some point, um, Ethan Allen captured the fork in 1775, and two days after he captured it, he wrote a personal letter to George Washington uh, telling him about the state of affairs and how dismal it was and this and that, and he personally signed it, which was interesting because in those days, um, they had scribes that made the copies, and then the principals who maybe dictated the letter, like in this case, Alan would sign, or, um, yeah, Alan, um, Alan would, would sign it. Well, in this case, he not only signed the letter, but he wrote it out. And um, while I was here, uh, we had hired a, a consultant uh, to tell us how to furnish the inside of the, the house and um, he was a collector of textiles, old textiles. He was down in an old store in the heart of Old Albany poking around and he bought a whole box of textiles for five bucks or something like that and he took it home, started going through it and lo and behold, here was one of these original letters from Ethan Allen. And uh, so he came to me and at my Chase Mill, I had a safe that came out of the fifth floor of the, the, uh, the uh, on, at the top of, of Church Street, of the Masonic Temple. And I was there one day and they were taking the furniture out, selling it all off. And I bought this beautiful safe. The inside was all painted with oils and pictures, and, and I bought it on the ground for 350 bucks, and had them deliver it to my office at the Chase Mill. Four feet wide and six feet high. It weighed dice. When I sold it, we had to weigh it. Weighed 5,035 pounds. And uh, so, anyway, this guy that I got to know quite well wanted to know if I would store this original letter from him. So he gave me the letter, I put it in my safe, and I didn't see him again for about three years. And he showed up one day and said, well, I'd like to have my letter back. So I had made copies of it, which I still have. He sold the letter for $100,000. <laughs> and uh, it was sold to a a Vermont doctor lived at the time in San Francisco, and I've forgotten his name, but he's got the biggest collection of Ethan Allen stuff. What was his name? John? No? Yeah. So, anyway, it's kind of a neat letter. I've got copies of it. So, any other questions? Thank you for coming, and it's been a tradition around here that we give uh, our speakers an Ethan Allen mug if you don't have one already in your collection. So, all right, thank you very much. And Angie, perhaps you may want to say a few words about what's happening next week. Yeah, okay. Okay. So coming up next week, we have our biggest week of the year here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Thursday is a Vermont state holiday called Ethan Allen Day. And so we have free admission here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum on Thursday, so please come by. If you haven't yet been to the Allen House, you can take a tour. 
And then the following weekend, so next weekend, is Ethan Allen weekend, and we have revolutionary war reenactors, traditional artisans doing demonstrations. We have our one of our wood carvers here today. Hi, Bob. <laughs> we'll see you then. Um, and it's going to be a big, big weekend with lots of fun things. There's going to be a garden tour in addition to the house tours and militia demonstrations. So please bring your families and spread the word for that. Um, but before we get to that, we still have one last thing to do up here. So we had this talk uh, strategically planned for Father's Day um, for uh, Tom Anderson as one of our founding fathers as a Father's Day gift from the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. We have a little gift for you. beautiful watercolor painting of the Allen House here at the homestead um, that we'd like to gift to you so you can remember us and as a thank you. Well, thank you very much. I have two other pictures, not quite like this, that I will donate back to the homestead that you can put up. So. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. I think we have three, three people who can't. Do you have something else? I was just going to say, I'm going to put these poster boards that the wind knocked down. I'll put them back up here. And for those of you who didn't know, uh, Ralph Nading Hill is, is one of the men in one of the photographs. So you can come up and look at them or ask um, our lecturer any other questions you might have. 